Welcome, comrades. Uh, just before we start, I just want to do, um, oh, thank you. Um, I want to acknowledge that we're meeting on um, uh, Aboriginal land, land that's never been ceded, uh, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, and uh, I want to pay my respects to elders past and present, as well as any other Aboriginal people here today. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, now, this talk is kind of jam packed. I'm hoping I'm not going to overwhelm you because there's just so much to talk about and it's so fascinating. Um, so I'm going to try and keep it, if I can, the, my talking to about 35 to 40 minutes, but I've got about five to eight minutes, maybe 10 minutes of video as well. So please bear with me. Um, and uh, I'm going to hopefully be able to work both these and that at the same time. All right, so let's let's make um, a start. Oh, and please forgive my, I'm sure I'm going to butcher the uh, both um, Russian <laughs> and Korean names. So my apology to anybody who speaks Russian and Korean and knows how they should actually be pronounced. Um, all right, so let's, how do I start this? Okay, here we go. All right, so in 19, uh, whoops, is that right? Is it working? All right, I'll do the first picture. Yay! Um, all right, so in uh, 1918, uh, the Russian Far East was plunged into a bloody civil war as Bolshevik forces fought to defend the revolution against the onslaught of anti capitalist, uh, sorry, anti communist forces, uh, backed by nine imperialist countries, including the United States, Britain, and Japan. The brutality of the civil war was amply demonstrated when Khabarovsk. Uh, in the Russian Far East was overrun by Japanese forces on the 5th of September 1918. After seizing the city, the Japanese Imperial forces arrested and executed the Bolshevik leadership in that city. Among those executed was Alexandra Stanikovich. Uh, born Kim Aram and known as Alexandra Kim, she was a leading Bolshevik and the first Korean to be recognised as a communist activist. Um, so, here we go. All right, so this gives you an idea of where we are. So uh, hopefully you can see where Moscow is and you can see where um, uh, the Far East is. So it's a long way away. Uh, so born in a small village in Siberia, which was a hotbed of Korean nationalism at the time, her father would die in 1895 while fighting as part of the Korean independence forces against Japan. At age 10, Kim would be taken in by her, father, her father's comrades, the St St uh, Stanovich family. After graduating college, um, she became a primary school teacher and married the son of the family that had taken her in. However, at the age of 30, uh, in 1915, she left her husband and moved to Vladivostok, Vladivostok um, to become politically active in the labor movement and join the socialist underground. And in 1916, she joined the Bolsheviks faction of the RSDLP. After the um, October Revolution, uh, Kim was appointed the Commissaire of the Far East Department of the Bolshevik Party um, uh, by Lenin, and uh, she was fluent in uh, Russian, Mandarin, and Korean. Uh, and Lenin sent Kim back to Siberia to mobilize Koreans against the counter-revolutionary forces. Approximately 8,000 Koreans joined the Red Army, with this translating into one in every four able-bodied males joining. So that's actually a huge amount. Uh, and the key reasons why they joined the Red Army were one, that most Koreans were tenant farmers who faced serious discrimination. So the Bolshevik slogans of, you know, land, bread and peace and lend to the farmers um, re resonated with them. Koreans faced discrimination under the Tsarist regime and the Bolsheviks promised uh, an end to racial discrimination. Uh, in the Russian Far East, the anti-communist forces were supported and supplied by Japan, with Imperial Japan using its colony um, uh, in Korea as a staging base. At the time, most Korean intellectuals and nearly all active, uh, politically active Koreans in the National Liberation Movement saw the Bolsheviks as a natural ally against Japanese imperialism. Four months before her death in September 1918, um, Kim helped to found the Korean Communist Party, uh, meeting with Korean independence fighters Yi dong wee and Kim Rip in uh, Karbovsk. Uh, the Korean People's Socialist Party was founded in April 28, uh, 1918. When the white forces and their Japanese allies overran the city, Kim was captured and executed. Uh, she was executed on the 16th of September uh, and told her captors, I'm not afraid of death. Your days are numbered. 
You resemble a pack of dogs in a morning house and you will never overthrow communism. Your goal is a poke dream. Kim's last word to her Japanese executors were, executioners were reportedly freedom and independence for Korea. So during the same period that, um, that uh, Kim uh, was in the Far East, Korean nationalists were also active against the Japanese colonial rule on the Korean Peninsula. Among the Korean radicals carrying out armed struggle was, let's see if we can get this right. Didn't get this. Unfortunately, you were supposed to only see one at a time, but I mucked it up when I did it. Let's see if I can get that right. Okay. Um, so among the Korean radicals carrying out armed struggle was Yoon Hee Soon, uh, who formed the first all-woman um, righteous army. Such armies had been in existence since the 16th century uh, in, on the Korean peninsula and were irregular guerrilla armies who fought against repeated Japanese invasion. At the time of the colonial uh, uh, Japanese colonialism, around 60 known righteous armies were in existence. Yoon was married to the son of one of the commanders of a righteous army and originally tried to convince her father-in-law to fight with his forces, but, he, but she was refused. In 1907, she defied her father-in-law and formed the first all-woman uh, righteous army made up of 30 women who she trained in fighting techniques. Uh, Yoon led the militia in her militia in attacks on Japanese military camps, freeing Korean prisoners and hiding them often in caves. While Yoon's militia was made up of women, she encouraged cooperation between the, uh, her militia and the male-dominated militias to provide a stronger, more unified force to fight against Japanese uh, imperialism and colonialism. Later in her life, she founded a school to train new independence fighters, uh, continuing to support Korea's fight for independence until her death in, I, I think she died in the mid thirties. Um, the other person I uh, wanted to speak quickly about, um, Yoon was by no means the only woman who joined the armed struggle. Um, Nam uh, Jae Hoon was uh, also another woman who joined one of the uh, revolutionary armed groups um, in Manchuria in the 1920s. Uh, she went and what I thought was remarkable about her was that uh, she joined at the age of 46, telling her adult son she aimed to make the world worth living in. As a sniper and a company commander, Nam was tasked with assassinating key Japanese figures, uh, political figures. Uh, however, she was arrested in 1933 and tortured uh, for six months um, after a collaborator informed on her uh, to the Japanese police at the time she was preparing to go and um, assassinate one of the Japanese um, uh, ambassadors. And uh, I will mention a few of these. If, if people are interested in Korean movies and things like that, there is a movie called uh, Assassination. Uh, they don't use her name in it, but the female character in that is loosely based on her. Um, so it's a great movie. Um, despite the harsh torture, Nam remained undaunted and staged a hunger strike for 15 days, but she would die not long after being released because of her weakened condition. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Korean independence movement. So between 1919 and 1920, a liberal bourgeois independence movement against the Japanese colonization uh, inside Korea started to gain momentum, with more than 2 million Koreans from all walks of life, young and old, taking to the streets in more than 1,500 demonstrations over a six-week period. Protesters were beaten, arrested, tortured, murdered, and with more than uh, 7,000, uh, 7,500 killed, 16,000 injured, and 46,000 people arrested by the Japanese colonial forces. Among those who risked their lives as part of the anti-colonial um, Samsil or Mansei movement, Mansei uh, comes from the chant, which means uh, long live Korea, um, which was very used at the time and is still used today in a lot of demonstrations in Korea, uh, was Korean high school student Yu Kwon Sun. Yu joined the 1st of March protests with her fellow high school students and was arrested but later released. In the wake of the student protests, the colonial regime uh, closed down all the Korean schools and Yu returned to her hometown. Um, sorry, I should give you a picture of her. This is her arrest photo, by the way. Um, uh, um, so she returned to her hometown, uh, secretly bringing with her a copy of the Declaration of Independence that had been read out uh, at Pagoda Park during the protests. 
in uh, uh, Chonan, her hometown. She became a key organizer along with her brother and her father um, of the local movement. Uh, you, you toured the district, speaking with local villagers, schools, workers, churches, groups, convincing them to, to participate in the um, struggle. On the 1st of April, 4,000 uh, workers, students and farmers mobilized in opposition uh, to the Japanese occupation. They were attacked by the Japanese police um, who opened fire on them, uh, killing uh, 19, including Yu's mother and father. Yu was arrested and imprisoned. Undaunted, she used her trial to stage um, protests demanding Korean independence and an end to Japanese rule. Incarcerated in So Dae Mun prison, Yu continued to organize. After, uh, after months of torture, unfortunately, she died on the 28th of September, 1920, uh, just two and a half months short of her 18th birthday. Her last words were defiant. Uh, her only regret was that she wished she could have done more. So I'm gonna show briefly, um, there's again a film, some of it for the older stuff, it was really hard to find films, uh, actual proper footage. Um, so I'm using some of the films that have been made. So the next film is a film that was made a couple of years ago called A Resistance, which Liz and I went and saw when it was here in Melbourne. And it's a fantastic film, uh, which talks about basically used time in prison. So I'm just gonna see if I can play that. Do I just hit? in a place. Okay. Shukan Bango, Sana, my chido. Nurse Tonya and I, G. Cook at Tony, was it to go? Manse, you guys kill her, Sneaker. ドラ같은데 自ら囚人だという事を教示しております。この部屋で始まりました。大安族です。大安。監獄様安全に戻る監獄様。最後へ入り方。最後へ入り方。Um, it, is, it is a bit of a harrowing film, but it is really worth seeing if you get a chance. Um, okay, so among the other women who were in prison with um, you was Kim Hyang Hua, who was also who had also participated in the um, uh, in, yep, great, thank you. Um, who'd also participated in the March 1st protest. Kim was a leader of the Gisadang, um, a pro indigenous movement made up, uh, made up of Kisangs. The Kis I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this correct. The Kisangs are often described in flowery terms as highly trained courtesans. Uh, in reality, they were en enslaved sex workers who were property of the state. In uh, uh, Korean Joseon society, social status was hereditary. Um, and if your mother was a slave or a kisang, then you were a slave or a kisang. Um, uh, their status, uh, the status of uh, kisang was also doled out as a means of punishment um, to, uh, with female relatives of uh, the arist ar aristocracy um, who had committed crimes, often being condemned to a life of servitude and dishonor. Despite being of the slave class, um, Kasangs had also rights uh, that, not, that weren't afforded to other slaves. For example, they could own property and they could be paid for their services. And because of their role included providing artistic and entertainment and conversation, so it wasn't just sex work, there was other aspects of it, uh, to the upper class, they were also highly educated often better than women of the ruling class, whose primary role was to be homemakers who look after just their husband and children. 
Uh, the top picture there is of a, a Kisang school. Often their education would start very early from the age of six or 10. Uh, and it mirrored that of the young man or aristocracy. Um, not only did they study things like etiquette, etiquette dance and music, but they also were educated in philosophy, history, medicine, and often could speak more than one language. This is just a depiction of them entertaining. Um, their involvement in the struggle for independence was unsurprising as they had a long history of being politically active, including acting as spies and key sources of information for righteous armies, because often, you know, the ruling class would go there and the diplomats and they would get all the, all the sort of information. Um, oh, what have I just done? Wrong one. Okay. Uh, so after the March 1st movement, um, the Korean anti-colonial nationalist movement developed rapidly, spreading throughout Korea and beyond. This nationalistic consciousness manifested in Manchuria through the armed struggle and within Korea through the efforts of the labor, farmer and youth movements. After Japan's 1910 annexation of the peninsula, the Korean working class expanded in both size and class consciousness. Between 1910 and 1945, the Korean, Korean population grew from 15 to 24 million. Korea was overwhelmingly an agrarian society, but it began to industrialize, mainly around mining and manufacturing. Uh, city dwelling dropped from three uh, went from 3% at the start of colonization to 14% by the end of Japanese rule. Um, not only were peasants evicted from their lands and forced into factories, but the rapid boost in Japanese investment um, also resulted in an expanded working class. Between 1926 and 1931, the number of industrial clashes more than doubled and the number of workers participating in them rose from just under 6,000 to more than 21,000. Inspired by the Russian Revolution and sobered by the lessons of the March 1st movement, communist circles throughout Korea began to fuse with the workers' movement. That this changed the class balance, uh, putting the politically conscious workers at the center of the movement. As mentioned previously, the first Korean Socialist Party was uh, formed by Kim Aram and other fellow independence fighters in 1918. By 1922, the party had nearly 7,000 members. Um, so by the early 1920s, communism had become an important part of the discourse of anti-colonial resistance in Korea. The first domestic Korean Communist Party was established in Seoul in 1925, um, after constant, but after constant surveillance, it was dissolved, dissolved in 1928, forcing uh, the activists underground uh, into labor unions, um, factories, student groups, and youth movements. In the early 1920s, there was a rising sentiment among the communist circles that there needed to be an umbrella organization to allow co cooperation with the March 1st nationalist camp. This led to the formation of Singhenho, or the New Trunk Association. It was founded in February 1927 and sought to unify different factions of the communist, socialist, and nationalist factions. It remained the key um, organizing uh, group leading the anti-colonial struggle up until May 1932. And it had between 30 and 40,000 members and approximately 100 branches outside of Seoul. Its platform, among other things, called for an abolishment of racial, political, and economic oppression, free speech, organization, association, and publishing, support for youth and women's equality, uh, and the overturning of factionalism and clan nepotism. A parallel women's organization, the Gu Nyu Hu, sorry, I'm so bad, uh, was founded three months later uh, um, in May 1927, combining classic liberal feminism with socialist class orientated demands. Um, ANU academic Ruth Barraclough, who's written on, particularly on the factory, factory girls during this period, and also on um, communist, she has a book called Red Love, um, uh, which is, uh, looks at sort of feminism and communism during this period. Um, she said the, in her book, uh, Ruth Barraclough talks about how some of the best known communists at this time in the 1920s were actually women. Not only were they regarded as being notorious, they were also regarded as being glamorous. They frequented the social pages as well as the arrest notices in the daily newspapers. It was pretty cool, isn't it? I thought that was, I like that. <laughs> uh, three of the most prominent women communists at the time were Ho Jong Suk, who is this person here, um, Vera Khan and Chung Chil Song. Um, okay, unfortunately, and they all participated in the May, uh, March 1st 
um, uprising. Um, I, unfortunately, I couldn't find a picture of Vera Khan, um, but she was um, a nurse who spent one month in prison after the Mansay demonstrations. And in the years that followed, she worked as a labor organizer among the women factory workers. Uh, in 1925, um, Khan and Ho Jong Suk, um, who was also a journalist, orator, and labor organizer, formed the Korean Women's Society of Comrades, which was the first socialist feminist organization in Korea. Among the women who also were part of the organization was Chung Chil Song, one of the many Kisangs who had participated in the 1st of March demonstrations and later joined the Communist Party. Uh, she was also an author who wrote the very first women's magazine and she called on the national movement to set, put at its center the struggle um, uh, of those in particular women who had nothing. Um, Ruth Barakoff, as I mentioned, the uh, ANU academic, um, notes that the period that followed the division of the Korean Peninsula, Khan, Ho and Chung have been reduced, as she puts it, to characters in the Cold War order that looked for an archetypal tale of perfidy and tragedy. In both Ho and Chung's cases, they joined the communist forces that fled to North Korea in the wake of the US military occupation of South Korea, which actually actively sought to suppress and jail communists. In North Korea, both women became prominent figures in the regime there. However, um, Chung was purged in, from the regime in 1958. In Khan's case, she went to the Soviet Union after she married in 1928. And in 1937, her and her husband were among the Korean communists who were arrested and purged uh, during Stalin's 1937 to 1938 purges. All right, I'll leave that there. Well, so you can read that as I'm talking, hopefully you can do both things. Um, so the, the 1933 platform of the Korean Communist Party in South Chola, which is in the South of Korea, um, and by this stage they're underground, um, illustrates the struggle faced by female factory workers at the time, with the platform calling for the abolition of the repressive dormitory system, production-based wages and differing wages from, um, and the equal wages for Japanese and Korean workers, as well as the adoption of an eight hour workday for adults, a six hour workday for youths aged between 16 and 18, and the abolition of child labor, a paid holiday once a week. At that stage, I think they're only allowed a holiday, like a break once a month. Um, maternity leave and breaks for breastfeeding children, for breastfeeding mothers who are feeding children. Um, so the dismal working conditions of female workers um, was further outlined here in this 1936 article, which I'm not gonna read out, so I'm just gonna leave that there for people to read through. Um, so at the time, women working in the silk, cotton and weaving um, industries, as well as the rice and food processing factories uh, are often portrayed today as being having little agency due to the oppressive system under which they labored. This is not the case. Um, and I'll give you an example of why. This is Kang Ju Rong, um, who was a female, one of a, a prominent female labor activist. Um, she worked in the Pongyang um, rubber factory uh, and emerged as a central figure in the labor protests during the 1930s. In 1931, Kang and 48 other women at the labor uh, at the rubber factory were locked out. And in response, she claimed she climbed up onto the roof of the Ulmi Pavilion, which was apparently the biggest building in. Um, Pongyang at the time, and staged the first ever rooftop uh, sit-in, which lasted for eight hours. She told the Japanese police, I refuse to come down until the foreman of the uh, rubber factory retracts his statement regarding wage cuts, and do not think that they will succeed in taking me down from here by force. I would rather die, fall and die, than have anyone take me and put a ladder against this roof. Kang's example of defiance would become a mainstay of South Korean protests in the second half of the century with various um, different roof sit-ins and protests happening. And I just want to, I, I did want to talk her, but because I've already got too much, I'm just going to very briefly me mention um, uh, Kang uh, kyung Ye, uh, who was um, an independent uh, communist sympathizer, uh, but she's also recognized as one of the greatest writers from this period. Basically, um, she was based in Manchuria and she um, uh, she wrote about basically the lives of the factory girls and the women in order to his life. And she was able to, you know, actually get a lot of socialist issues across without it being censored. She also reported on a number of uprisings and things like that. Um, if you're, I meant to bring the book in with me and I left it at home, but this has been translated a couple of years ago. It's as one of her key 
novel novels from Wanzo Pond. Um, so if you're interested in reading any of the work, you can. All right, let's move on. Okay, so after the division of the Korean Peninsula, US imperialism imposed a four year military occupation in South Korea, uh, which was not only contemptuous of everything Korean, but virulently anti-communist. Lieutenant General um, John Hodge actively sought to root out communist and labor um, activism. At the time in 1946, there'd been a poll done by the US revealed that 70% of Koreans supported so socialism and 7% had supported communism. Hodge refused to work with the Korean independence activists who had established the Korean People's Republic and the Popular People's Committee, instead installing, according to one journalist, a motley assortment of expatriates, collaborators, fascist reactionaries, professional assassins and confused intellectuals. Strikes were banned, the KPR and the People's Committees declared public enemies, their leaders arrested, demonstrations crushed and the US puppet Songmin Rhee installed. So that's just to give you an idea of the division. It's along the 38th parallel. I've written an article on this in Red Flag, which discusses why that happened. Um, if comrades want to check it out. So Re would continue to continue the repression through the 1950s. Um, in, uh, so this is him there. And that's a picture of um, Re in the blue. And in the middle is uh, Douglas MacArthur, the US general. And on the other side is John Hodge, the leader of the occupation in South Korea. Um, so in April uh, 1960, workers and students fed up with the depression and corruption of the Re regime, uh, staged what was now known as the um, April Revolution. Protests began when the discovery of the body of a high school student, Kim Ju Yul, who had been killed in a March um, protest against the rigged elections. In an attempt to suppress the protests, another 186 protesters were killed by Re's forces. On the 26th of January, two weeks after the protests began, Re resigned and fled the country. The student and workers' victories, however, was very short-lived. Just over a year later, Park Chung-hee launched a military coup d'etat against the Second Republic government. This is him at the time of the coup in the middle at the forefront. Um, Park's coup was backed by the US government, both militarily and financially. His regime sought to rapidly industrialize and develop South Korea's econom economically through a combination of dysfunctional economic shock therapies and mass repression. His favorite tool of repression um, and the primary architect of South Korea's development state was the Korean um, Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, it was modeled, of course, on... Um, on the CIA, but had far more... <laughs> reach than the, even the American one. Um, it was established with the help of the, the, the US CIA, but it, it, it instituted a reign of terror and censorship. Not only did it um, take control of government planning, advising and inspecting government bureaucracy, it was in charge of recruiting and hiring government bureau, bureaucrats and technocrats. Uh, it oversaw the sponsorship of businesses, corporate development and government legislation. The role of the Korean CIA was to eliminate any obstacles in the way of, of the military junta, uh, politically, economically, or socially. Um, I did a talk a couple of years ago on the Gwangju uprising, which I talked more about Park's regime and that, if comrades want to check that out. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the workers during this period. Of all the work, workers being squeezed by Park's drive to build the economy, none were more exploited than the female textile workers. 20,000 girls aged between 12 and 17 labored 16 hours a day, seven days a week in horrendous working conditions. Although the labor standard laws existed, uh, which mandated an eight hour work day, they were regularly ignored. While the industry was predominantly female, there were men working in the industry. And on the 13th of November, 1970, worker uh, Chon Tail, in a desperate attempt to uh, draw attention to the plight of the textile workers, self humiliated shouting, um, deserve, observe this, uh, the labor standard laws as he died. John's death, uh, that's him there on the left. And this is his mother. His mother and sisters were also activists. Um, um, his death had an enormous impact on the course of the labor struggle, as well as the anti-dictatorship movement in South Korea. In the aftermath of his death, Dozens of night schools for, student, uh, for, for workers were established to teach workers basic skills, not only reading and writing, uh, but also politics, their rights as a worker and how to organize um, within the working class. 
Um, so I want to talk about two particular struggles that happened during this time. The women workers at the centre of the textile industry were both subject to exploitation as labourers and also to structural gender discrimination, receiving, for example, just 56% of the wage that their male counterparts received. Um, uh, and this was, you know, done on the pretext that they supposedly they were secondary um, earners. Thank you. Um, Um, when in 1972, women textile workers voted out the male chair of the Dong Il Textile Labor Union, basically the unions were centered around each of the companies and factories. Um, so it wasn't like necessarily at the time, there were broader unions, but often each workplace had its own union. Um, and they elected a woman leader for the first time in the history of the Korean labor movement. They were met with a campaign of, to undermine the new leadership. The campaign was no more evident than during the 1976 union leadership election. Before the election, female workers who were standing for election were beaten by their class collaborationist male co-workers. And the company also bribed police and um, to investigate independent minded unionists and leaders uh, involved in uh, the company, uh, in the workforce. When the election day arrived, pro-management workers nailed the doors of the residential dormitory shut to prevent female workers from voting. The women were able to smash down the door and stage a sit, sit in uh, strike. In response, the company and class collaborationist workers barricaded the toilet shut, cut water supplies and electricity supplies. And this only resulted in the number of women growing um, from 200 to 400. On the third day, the government riot squads were sent in to try and break up the sit-in. Um, uh, seeking to prevent the attack, many women disrobed. I, I love this story. Um, seeking to prevent the attack, many women disrobed uh, to their underwear, thinking that you know this would stop them being attacked uh, because the cops wouldn't know what to do. And apparently, they sang union songs while twirling their clothing around their heads, which I think is just such a great sight. Um, the tactic initially did stop the police, who didn't know how to handle the women, but they soon started clubbing and arresting them. All up, 72 women were arrested. 50 of them had lost consciousness after being assaulted. 14 were hospitalized and two women were so traumatized that they were put into a basically um, mental health institution for about six months. The workers, however, succeeded the following year in, uh, in electing their fellow female textile worker, Lee Chong Duck. Um, but 10, minutes, 10 months later, the Korean CIA formed an organized action squad within the National Textile Workers Union in order to suppress what they saw as a problem union. Female, so this picture that you can see here, this is of this incident, female union members had a screaming uh, human excrement plastered on their faces, breasts, and in their mouths when they attended a general assembly meeting. Um, basically, they were very badly assaulted. Days later, Lee and the leadership, uh, her leadership of the, the Dong Il textile labor factory were expelled from the broader NTWU. Lee and her fellow activists, um, this is a quote, this quote here is um, basically uh, her talking about what the conditions in the factory was like when she first joined. Um, Lee, and, um, Lee and her fellow active uh, unionists continued to fight, staging hunger strikes and public protests, despite being beaten, arrested and accused of being North Korean agents. They, along with hundreds of other women, lost their jobs and were blacklisted and prevented from working in other places. Despite their losses, their struggles continued to uh, contribute to the building of the South Korean radical trade union movement and laid the ground for other labour struggles that were to follow, uh, including the next one, which is the... Um, YH strike. Uh, so YH was a wig company um, uh, and they had 4,000 women working there and they threatened to close down and relocate overseas uh, rather than accede to the women's demand for increased wages. Uh, so in response, the women went on strike um, and the company again, similar to what happened with the earlier strike, um, shut off water and electricity to the workers' dormitories. The protest was subsequently moved outside the New Democratic Party, which was the opposition party at the time, uh, hoping to generate more public support. On the third day of the protest, again, the Park regime dispatched more than 2,000 riot police to forcibly evict uh, the protesters. Police beat the protesters, the NDP representatives and journalists. Uh, leaders of the YH union were arrested and 21-year-old um, 21-year-old Kim Kyung Soo who was also a member of um, the union committee was killed. 
While none of the workers' demands were met, the police cracked down and the following, uh, uh, the following ousting of the opposition leader, Kim Yong-sang of the NDP, served as a catalyst for subsequent protests, such as the Pusan Mus uh, Masan movement, which um, put widespread pressure on the Park regime. It actually then caused massive division inside the Park regime. And this would lead to the assassin assassination of Park by the head of his own CIA just three months later. So um, it's uh, the quote up the top, that's from the leader of the union. And she's quick to say the women workers brought down the Yusin regime. Yusin was the name of Park's regime from 1972 to 1979. It was, to, it was centered around the constitution, which he basically changed to suit him, to keep him in power forever. Um, and it, Yusin means renewal or renovation. So um, the struggle in this period is known as the struggle against the Yusin. Okay, oops, we're going, getting there. All right, what's this picture of? Oh, it's Guangzhou. Okay, so the democratic space opened up by the Park's death, however, was again short-lived. 17 days this time after Park's assassination, General Chung Dohan seized control through another military coup. As the democracy movement was repressed in Seoul by Chun's junta, the democratization struggle moved to Guangzhou in the south, again in South Jola. Um, to, the, uh, to Guangzhou, which is a city which was predominantly working class. Um, about, uh, there was about 700,000 residents and about 70 or 80% of the residents were working class. The Guangzhou uprising became a watershed event for South Korean society when student, uh, student protests developed into a citywide rebellion that, uh, that was later brutally crushed by the government troops. For 10 days from 18th to the 27th of May, the working class of Guangzhou defied Chun's military junta. For five of those days, the city was a liberated zone under the collective control of the people. And it's really quite amazing what they did. Um, and again, another book I meant to bring in and I forgot, it's a novel, but it is written by a Korean um, uh, novelist from Guangzhou. Uh, and it's based on basically the events there, uh, which is very good. It's called um, Human Acts by um, um, Han, uh, Kang Han, Han Kang. Sorry, so I really highly recommend it's it'll make you cry. I, I think I cried in every chapter of it, um, but it's a great book. Um, all right, so uh, although the Ganju uprising ended in bloody defeat with 20,000 troops storming the city, it became the driving force behind the South Korean pro democracy movement through the 1980s and it ushered in the next phase of working class popular struggle. So I'm just gonna see if we can get this to work again. This was actually about photos that were found later, like 40 years later, but this was the best imagery I could find. Again, if you want to see some films that are based around these events, I uh, highly recommend um, uh, A Taxi Driver um, and um, This is one of the mass rallies. They had mass rallies during the liberated time, not just every day. Actually, two or three times a day they had mass rallies. I'm gonna just let that finish and I'll start talking. Um, <laughs> um, so after Guangzhou, 
For many intellectuals and students, Guangzhou was a life-changing event as it had been the workers in the Lumpen proletariat who fought and died in the provincial building during the last stand against Chun's troops. Those who survived Guangzhou, Guangzhou were weighed down with immense shame and guilt. Uh, along with the intensified brutality of, thank you, of the Chun regime, it resulted in a seismic shift from, in both the student and the workers' movement. Students started to um, smuggle in Marxist and anarcho-Marxist literature from Japan as well as North Korea to make sense of the world, world and it led to a widespread debates about Korean capitalism and society. This led to a re-evaluation of their activities of the student movement and the intelligentsia in the 1970s and their lack of roots in the working class struggle. So, um, oh, sorry, that's what I've just said, so you can just ignore that. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and this, um, this resulted in a strategy to build alliances between um, uh, students, uh, sorry, I've lost my face, um, uh, students and the working class. Thousands of students became hakul, I don't know if that's pronounced, again, pronounced correctly, in the 1980s. Basically, these were just what was known as disguised workers. They began to enter factories as workers, making a conscious decision to join the working class struggle. It was basically illegal for them to do that. You had to um, change your documentation and your identity papers, and if you were caught, then you could be, you know, arrested, tortured, lots of new things. One of the disguised workers was 23-year-old student Kwon In-suk. This is a more recent photo of her. Um, in July 6, 1986, um, the Korean Daily carried a one-sentence item at the bottom of the social page that Kwon had sued a detective, charging him with sexual torture during her recent detention. The small news item would rock Korean society for months. As part of the Andong Kwon, Literally, which literally means uh, the democratization movement sphere, Kwan's decision to go public with the charge of sexual abuse was unprecedented. She was only one of the estimated three to 10,000 workers, students working clandestinely in the factories in the mid 80s. Like others, um, she had forged her identification card to obtain a factory job. In doing so, many of them, um, of the, the students who did this, endured torture, arrest, sexual assault, and even death. Kwon would become an emblematic figure embodying the passion, the ideals and the conflicting legacies of the 1980s um, movement. She's actually, um, uh, last year she's just elect, she was just elected to the Korean National Assembly. She's part of um, uh, Moon Jae-in, the president's party. I don't know, uh, she, she went back to school and became a feminist scholar, I heard as well, so. Um, all right, so we're almost at the end, we're getting there. Um, hopefully you guys aren't uh, still finding this interesting. Um, okay, so now we're going to jump to the 87 uprising. Uh, this, um, this strategy uh, that adopted by the students, um, however, was instrumental in helping to organise and mobilise workers in 1987 as part of the June uprising, where millions marched for democracy. There was a 19-day uprising across the country against the Chan Dohan um, regime, um, and it involved a broad coalition of forces. The driving force, however, were the war workers and the students who raised as a central slogan, remember Guangzhou. Um, so this, again, I found a lot of trouble. For some reason, you would think there'd be really good footage on 87, but there isn't. So this is not my favourite video, but it will get, at least give you a bit of an idea of what went on. The, the dissidents were tortured. Again, another movie, which is really great, if you're gonna see it, it's called 1987, When the Day Comes. And the student they just showed you was about his torture and murder by the police, which was a catalyst for the protests.
대통령이 직선제를 택하지 않을 수 없다는 결론에 이르게 되었습니다. On. Almost finished. Okay, so um, um, in the post Chun period, the legacy of the under Kwan uh, can be seen when 85% um, of the newly established um, uh, National Council of Trade Union, the precursor to what is now the Korean Confederation of. Oh, stop that there. Oh, yeah. Uh, actually, can we go past that one to the next one? I put it in just in case I had time in the vain hope that we're going to have time. <laughs> That's it. Great. Terrific. Oh, don't want to start it yet. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, so, yes, 85% of the new um, of the workers in the new Council of Trade Union actually came from the Labor student underground. Um, since 87, uh, workers, socialists and left activists have ha still had to fight for their rights. Faced with neoliberalism and austerity, Korean workers have continued to face long hours, poor work conditions, increasing casualisation and job precariousness. Today in South Korea, women workers in particular, uh, those working in the irregular part-time or casualised employment, are some of the most marginalised and least likely to be unionised. These women, however, um, are, uh, over the last decade and a half, have sought to demand better wages, conditions, and job security. Uh, one such example is the June 2007 struggle by the Eland workers. 600 mostly women workers employed um, by the supermarket chain took control of the company's la largest store, launching their fight for job security and equality for, for regular workers and against outsourcing. A week later, workers of another supermarket chain who were part of the same corporate group also took control of their largest store and uh, made similar demands. The strike continued for 510 days with workers taking over and occupying 22 stores nationally. In the end, the women won a guaranteed pr promotion to a regular uh, to regular employed workers who had exceeded 16 months of a working period, increases in wages, and also the, the 12 Eland um, protest leaders were released from jails. The video I skipped, which I was going to show, was again another movie. It's called Cart. Uh, it's excellent, and basically it's a fictionalised account of the, this particular struggle around of the women, uh, and it's, it's a, um, you've seen it. We watched it. Yes, yes. Yeah, Liam will attest that it's good. All right. So I'm going to finish up now. We're right at the end. Um, the radical and revolutionaries who I've discussed in this talk are not simply historical figures. Their actions and activities have lit the path for the struggles of the working class in South Korea, at least. Uh, I wanted to end this talk with the footage from the 2016 protest that brought down the, the South Korean presidency of Park Gun hai And if you weren't aware, Park Gun hai was actually the daughter of Park Chan-hee, the dictator. Uh, and while she wasn't going to the extent he was, she was trying to bring in very many repressive uh, issues. While the protests were very in a very liberal framework, what they did show uh, is that collective organizing works and that the working class are the driving force for change within capitalism. Okay, thank you.